I use magazines very greedily, um, primarily in order to achieve economy in time. And I think that the usefulness of a magazine should uh, be in continuously recorded by oneself. I write notes on magazines, even if I mean to throw them away after a short time. I also do a lot of tearing out of articles and filing. Um, I think one should avoid too many magazines, and the ones that I'm discussing this morning are the ones that I read or look at regularly, without exception. That is not just the ones that um, I use in the office. I'm not talking about any magazines uh, which I think bad or don't look at, because that would be a uh, negation of the point I made earlier about economy of time. I'm not particularly interested in other architects' views about architecture. Uh, this may be a, sh a shortcoming. I'm not particularly interested in looking at detailed architectural photographs or indeed plans of, of chosen beautiful buildings. I'd rather see a third-rate building being built than a first-rate one in the pages of magazines. And this, I think, will come out in the magazines I show. It's interesting that in adding up the magazines, well over 50% of the total range that I look at, I receive free. If in fact one then uh, takes the percentage of ones that one looks at every issue and reads every issue, as opposed to ones which one gets occasionally, then the percentage that I get free rises to about 80%. And therefore, it might be worth looking at the magazine that a particular institute or society or body produces, as opposed to the activities it offers. And in uh, two instances, I've never been to a single meeting of the institution. I don't think I've even voted for its, its steering committee, and I've joined it entirely in order to rece receive its house journal, its magazine. The, uh, We'll now go through the whole range. And the first one is building design, which I'm sure has been mentioned before. Um, and all these first ones, and I'll, I'll mention when, in fact, one has to start paying for them, all these are free. Building design has improved immensely uh, since Peter Murray became editor, and it's and yet it's, it's still um, a scurrilous gossip paper. And I think this is its value. I don't really think that the, um, the studied article in depth is of much value in such a magazine. I think its timing, its ability to pick the news others have it, value. And indeed, it's, it's uh, it's the nearest thing to an architectural uh, design radio program, Woman's Hour, or something like that. Um, now, the next magazine is Industrial Equipment News. And this is one of three magazines which provide an answering service, which I believe Building Design does as well. But every article, every advertisement, and every product in these three magazines, which uses the first one, uh, has a number and enables you on a prepaid card to obtain more information. And this service we use very fully. When I say we, I mean myself and the office. The second one um, is engineering materials and design, from which this cutting of the new British attempt on the land speed record car came. And the third one, which I don't have on the rack, is mechanical handling news. Magazines, I've had difficulty in being put on the free mailing list, because in each case, they questioned whether an architect was suitable, was a suitable subject to receive this magnificent free gift every month. However, one does get it, having made the point that um, the architect is singularly lacking in information on industrial equipment 
on engineering materials and certainly on mechanical handling. Those three I, I read, with, read and look at with delight. The next magazine, uh, though free, is one of the ones <coughs> that I mentioned that I receive as being a member of a society, and in this case it's the American Future Society, uh, which is a rather sort of feeble organization. It does produce this magazine, which often is very feeble, but now and again picks up subjects in a anticipatory way that have been covered in other magazines, but not such far-sighted. Very uneven magazine, and it's well worth looking at. The next one is the uh, Science and Public Policy magazine of, as I'm a member, of the Science Policy Foundation. This is extremely good, but you do have to join the foundation. It has, um, again, in order to conserve one's time, uh, to, to save a great deal of wasted time through reading lengthy articles, I find this magazine extremely useful in so much as it summarizes uh, facts from all over the world in both diagrammatic and written form uh, with a certain amount of wit and with great economy. We now move on to Offshore Engineer. This is a brand new magazine, that's the first number, and it goes uh, free to every member of the Society of Water Technology, of which I am one. Uh, being a member of the Society also enables one to get a certain uh, range of American publications free. This is an English publication. This, combined with the one you now see, with the illustrations of um, the NIG oil rig, is the uh, ocean industry, which is a rather more thorough brother to the English magazine, probably because it's been going longer, and has been produced for some years now from Houston, still the center of the oil industry. Um, and their concern with ocean industry and offshore engineering is, is obvious. However, these magazines give one an indication of the scale of problems that can be solved, and indication in a very solid internal um, method of how such solutions are being achieved. They're extremely well illustrated, and they introduce um, an element of excitement, certainly to me, and I hope to the office, purely because of the, the, the scale of the work and the speed with which it's undertaken, and the degree of detail that has to be um, expended on such work, which one doesn't find in architecture. I wish one did, but one doesn't find that. They're also very good at explaining where things have gone wrong. And few magazines do that, and even fewer architects do it. They, they, are, they are very good at explaining disasters and difficulties. That, that is valuable to find in a magazine. And it's certainly uh, valuable, I think, to build up a file, almost, of possible disasters in, in different fields that one might encounter. Uh, Next one is the RIBA Journal. Now, I get that free through <laughs> being a member of the RIBA, um, and it's almost the only reason that I'm a member of the RIBA, although that's slightly cheating. I, I'm also a member of the RIBA, not to get work, but in order to be able to um, work under, the, under their contract, use their library. However, this magazine has improved immensely since the appointment of the new editor, whose name, unfortunately, I forget. But the comment, the editorial comment, and the news coverage in the RIBA journal is very good. The dreary lectures and papers by distinguished bods that is the duty of the RIBA to put in um, are just as boring and irrelevant as ever. The next magazine is... Um, Underground Services, 
which is, is again, um, a new magazine uh, which I received free through being a member of the London Subterranean Survey Association, which deals with an aspect of, of planning and design, primarily underground, which most architects are not so much ignorant of, but are almost convinced that they, they should leave to someone else. Milton Keynes article is particularly interesting in so much, uh, that's a particular article I put on the rack, in so much as the whole generation of success or otherwise in Milton Keynes is largely based on what happens underground and whether it can happen at all. Now we're on to AD, uh, which I have to pay for. All those other ones, one gets free. AD, uh, I think probably, has become a very enjoyable habit for me. If I had to criticize any particular issue, I could probably find a lot wrong with it. But the fact that it carries on and that it does cover range both illustrated and written that other magazines find either a bit fey or a bit hairy uh, is its is its strength and long may long may it last next one ah construction news now this is a beauty i don't know how many uh, architects it i hope it's in a weekly in the uh, a common room, not so much the library, but you know, in the bar or somewhere. The projects that it covers each week um, is wider than, than building design. It also, because of its name and because of its, its uh, intention, tends to deal with things that aren't finished. It tends, the news tends to be in relation to obtaining contracts, um, in uh, preparing equipment, material, site conditions for contracts, and in fact, the difficulty or delight of achieving such contracts. It very seldom deals with the finished product, except some of the finished products uh, that are related to site construction, such as you, you've just seen, uh, the Nig Bay uh, Hostel, have great relevance to um, architectural problems and yet are seen as very commonplace in that paper and I'd recommend construction news. Uh, New Civil Engineer is a magazine which again has improved out of all respect, in fact it changed its name, but it is the, if I can read it, it is the magazine of the Institute of Civil Engineers and that is something that should be available in the AA and indeed every school and of course if you're a member of the Institute you get it free, but that is and um, extremely comic in both its prose and its illustration. Now we get on to a magazine where I cheat because primarily I buy this uh, for my mother, that's Country Life. Um, but I, I read it very heavily and look at it even more thoroughly. Really the poo in silver, 35 pounds, actual height one and a quarter inches. Um, I think what is, is good about country life, there's no um, disguising the fact that it's, it's, it's a sort of coffee table, middle class magazine for a town dweller who wished he was in the country. Um, the, uh, the hard edge, wet strength of a magazine like The Field. But it does have... Um, illustrations of houses and discussions of gardens and various things like that, which um, are from an entirely different angle. It's weakest, the weakest element of country life, in fact, is when, in fact, it asks architects to contribute and to talk about buildings. The best, the be the, its strength is when it does uh, news items uh, such as was on the screen in relation to planning aspects where the architectural aspect and the hard planning edge is not anything like so much interest to the magazine as the agricultural or um, 
local interest view. Therefore, I think that apart from the delight of the pictures in the magazine, it's a uh, fact that it's through another pair of eyes for only, only 35 pence a week. I think it's a great investment, and um, I'm delighted my mother asked me to buy it for her. Uh, New Society, I don't get every week. Now, that's, when we've got to Country Life, that's finished the ones that I get regularly. We're now getting on to ones which, uh, with the kindness, and this is what you need with magazines, is a very kind, uh, imaginative, hard-working news agent who will let you read the title pages and even the shorter articles without paying for the magazine and will also order back numbers of obscure magazines that he otherwise doesn't stock. And this I have. Um, and if anyone needs an advert, he does, and that's Hills News Agents in Good Street, who are magnificent. And the News Society and News Scientist, I pick and choose. I read the context, this contents list, and I look at the article before I buy them. I do with New Statesman, which I, in fact, haven't put on the rack. As I say, this is an entire range of my reading, with a possible exception of odd overseas magazines, mainly fashion magazines, which I do buy now and again. The Scientific American um, is a lot of money, and that certainly requires a great deal of, of choice in the news agents before I actually buy it. But fortunately, as I say, Hills actually stock that without ordering it. Now we come on to the only uh, foreign magazine that I've listed, and I would like just to talk about overseas magazines in general for a minute or two. Um, I don't uh, read any foreign language, and therefore, to some extent, it depends on the... I'm, I'm interested in the quality of the translation section they have in. Um, they do vary. They vary enormously over a very short period of time. And this is my, this one, which is uh, Techniques in Architecture. This is my, this is my favorite at the moment. And one reason that it's my favorite is that um, it's superbly printed, that there's some very clever man or men involved or women um, in relation to the scale at which they reproduce photographs and drawings. It's also superbly indexed. There's a couple of pages on the screen. Um, whatever subject they're dealing with, they give a, um, you know, a lazy man's uh, crib list as to what the article or the building is about. And therefore, you can, you can flip through and just read these panels at the top of the magazine before you waste a lot of time going into the main article. Um, I wish, I wish there was uh, uh, another foreign magazine that I could quote with the same delight at the moment, but there isn't. The last two magazines we don't have on the rack. Uh, one is Archigram, which uh, I not only uh, buy with delight, but hoard, and the other is Private Eye. I read three daily newspapers and don't have a cat. I think that's it. I never know quite how to uh, introduce Cedric Price. Um, but that doesn't really matter, uh, since he um, doesn't benefit from introductions. So, uh, can I just call on... I've done this as a leader. So, can I please uh, call on Cedric Price to give his uh, uh, last presentation as the architectural profession of future? The um, uh, whole conference, as please see, is called The Architect's Future. And so, but my section is, has the architectural profession of future. And I haven't uh, become at all clear this morning uh, just what the architectural profession is. And uh, Owen Luder's contribution made me even more confused. I would have thought that um, the profession has something to do with the social contract. 
and that the particular form of social contract in relation to a profession is one in which the professionals uh, require um, a certain um, or, or are invested with a certain amount of trust and that the rest of us um, as a result of this agreement on trust allow the professions a certain amount of operational privilege. Now, if this um, is so, and of course the architectural profession uh, to a large extent is not based on misery, unlike most other professions. Um, that is the misery of the, of the receiver, of those dispensed to. And it's quite a good indication of the validity of the architectural profession as to where what it does moves in to a misery situation. Because at those points, it may be that the profession is insufficient and too late for those tasks. Now, the um, question of accountability, um, again, uh, didn't seem to be um, raised all that much, or not as much as I, I feel it should be. And there is an interesting situation. To a large extent, in talking about the architectural profession, um, I'm talking about the architectural profession in this country and in Western Europe. I think the conference might do well as to decide uh, where the best example of the um, need to further the architectural profession can be find, found in a global situation, but that could wait for this afternoon. The interesting thing is that as um, the public sector responsibility in this country appears to be dropping off something awful in relation to architecture, the public funding of the so-called private sector, in which architecture is increasingly involved, um, doesn't appear to um, either uh, mention or indeed ask for any form of accountability. And I have not seen the architectural profession um, ask or suggest that such accountability is brought to bear in their field of endeavor. But the public funding is there. The uh, point about public funding is, is extremely important, particularly in relation to some of the um, items mentioned, uh, some of the aspects or some of the fields of activity mentioned earlier. Let's just look at, at uh, public funding, whether in private sector or, or public sector. Now, we know about uh, schools. Um, open university, a rather interesting mix. Um, the so-called uh, extremely expensive free university, another um, interesting one. Universities as such. Polytechnics as such. You have to put in the architectural context. Um, pension funds. Now that's an interesting one. A lot of the larger pension funds are now uh, jointly run by both both unions and management. But those who handle the pension funds, those who actually uh, commission the developments in hitherto quiet but rather boring North Hampshire towns or um, Piccadilly Circus or wherever, have no accountability either either to um, those who, who, who uh, administer the money or indeed those who are paying the pensions. This was raised, probably one of the, well, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most interesting points in a very boring, predictable report in the Wilson City Committee. Um, uh, the point of accountability for the spending of pension funds, which are a great, large uh, source of architectural fees. Um, banking. Now, again, the question of whether banking goes public or remains private is still uh, being discussed in this country, but it's interesting to note that there was no fuss in, in France when only about uh, eight years ago the 80% mark was reached of uh, nationally owned banking. There's only 20% private banking in France. Um, so I think uh, we may well uh, follow that. Um, insurance again. 
Again, large sources of, of, of funding for the built environment. Transport, largely public funding. Again, very large investment, capital investment. Um, uh, industry such as I imagine uh, Professor Gosling was talking about, um, British Leyland, cars, Rolls Royce, the rest, all belonging to us, at least when the money is needed. Um, and of course the largest industry of the lot in this country is still farming, by far the largest as far as numbers employed, which too is, is now in an EEC context uh, very largely public funded. Um, now, the next point uh, following on from that is the, is the fact that I haven't made these cards out very well. <laughs> Oh yes, back, back to that, back to that little bit about, little bit about misery, um, where we may have missed the boat. I would suggest, and I do not suggest that this is um, going to happen for all times, but I think it has got to be the architectural profession, and this picks up from the last talk, uh, the last talk. It's got to be the architectural profession that puts itself back in the uh, humanity scales to really be involved seriously, and of course that is housing. Now I really do think through uh, some um, mismanagement, some unfortunate circumstances, and a lot of extraordinarily bad design, that the architectural profession, to a large extent, has really opted out of housing um, from a humane point of view in this country at the moment doesn't necessarily mean that houses aren't being built, although a lot aren't. And I do, I do know the, the sort of, um, uh, you know, tweed jacket and single earring group who always feel that it's better to sort of tart up some boring old houses and, and you know, convince people that it's fun uh, hobbling over the cobbles. But there's still housing going on. That's what's called rehab. If you can't rehab, you go vernacular. I think it should be called a vuncular architecture. <laughs> um, now, the, coming on from that, and housing is always, always considered a hot subject, um, so it should be. Uh, someone was a bit upset that there didn't, although there been experiments, probably Professor Gosling again, I always listen to him rather more carefully than most. Um, the, the whole question of uh, normative uh, planning and, and participation, he seemed a little bit outraged that uh, having tried it so hard that the public weren't interested, that, that you don't get the participation. Now, that may be because what we are still thinking of in relation to housing and indeed in relation to a, a wide field of architectural endeavor is, is the, the product, not the process, that is encouraged by such a product. And therefore, um, particularly in relation to housing, there's a very good example of the attention of the public and the individual being related far more to the increasing invisible servicing that makes life, if not pleasant, at least possible, in a, a, a very carefully bureaucratically, and I use that word with, with delight and, and not dislike, um, bureaucratically organized country. That the whole, the whole network, say, of, of subsidies, of credits, of mortgages, of uh, leaseholds or tenant holds or ownership, etc., etc., related to housing, has far more direct humane effect on the occupants than the nature of the particular house. Um, so this invisible structure that is, is, is growing apace in this country, probably as we move well away from the second industrial age. <laughs> um, and, and we're now sort of seriously talking about all of us feeling rather old at about 45, which I totally concur with. Um, then the invisible servicing of this country is largely ignored by the architectural profession, not necessarily by some architects. And the increasing invisibility is usually related to, to
tertiary and quaternary industries. So you've got primary one, which is extractive, secondary, which is uh, manufacturing. The, uh, uh, I don't know, I can't do the matter now. Primary, secondary, uh, tertiary, which to a large extent is, is distribution, whether you call it retail or whatever. Quaternary, um, communications. And, and fifth one is a funny mixture of, of communications and energy. So it is not surprising that EMI, having spent an awful lot of money on their new headquarters over there and, and uh, employed private architects and all sorts of architects be outraged or delighted by the, the rape of Tottenham Court Road, which is, is, is I, I think that rape is one of the minimum crimes. <laughs> um, that uh, it is not surprising that EMA, EMI, long before the building was finished, decided that uh, they'd sell off half their record interests to Columbia, uh, they'd, they'd stay fragmented as they were, they'd move into satellites, etc., etc. And you don't need an office building with, with shiny marble, etc., etc., to run a, a satellite system. In fact, the last example of the absurdity of using the built environment as an indicator of the invisible environment was the whole fuss over whether they could afford in the final funding a stained glass, wi stained glass window in the headquarters of the open University of the Air at Milton Keynes, you know, I mean, and you're meant to get that information under plain cover by post or watch it on the screen. So the, um, well, I mean, another example, it doesn't matter a damn that breakfast TV is, is running out of an old warehouse and Pudlow's dock or whatever all those quaint little smelly places are in Camden Town. Um, the, uh, New invisibility has not been recognized by the profession, which is, you know, it's about 50 years out of time. Um, go away. The next point is uh, education, which was raised in relation to architect. I'm not sure about the, the word about uh, educate, don't train. I personally think that architecture education should be involved in making learning available. Um, there was some talk about education from above. In fact, the education is far better sideways. I, uh, you know, students, staff, practitioners, clients, or whatever order you want to put that around in, and is a lifelong process anyhow. I think that the um, key point to that is, is the point that Professor Lippmann made is that one should look on knowledge as, as a predictive tool. I hope you did say that. Oh, oh well, I prefer, ah, well, I prefer, that's a good one for this afternoon. <laughs> I, I wrote it the other way around because I, I preferred it. Um, <laughs> which is, which I am allowed to do at this institution. <laughs> that's very good. Right. The, um, the last, point is then that um, the where coming back to the subject matter is sometimes useful has the architecture profession a future so far I'm concerned the question of the profession is as I detail at the start of the talk I certainly think architecture has a, has a future and that architects have a future but only if they're involved in a process of continuous anticipation if architecture moves from the uh, curative to the preventive. I do not think that the instantaneous response to a particular problem by an architect is fast enough. Um, I don't think we're in the problem-solving business. Um, and I think that uh, what in fact architects should be, it's interesting, just an aside, quick aside, it's not one o'clock yet. Um, it's very interesting how the architectural profession has a number of blind spots which it supports through thick and thin and will have nothing to do with. Just to give one example, and not to make it emotive by using the American title, we'll use the English one, caravans. Architecture will have nothing to do with caravans. The nearest the architectural profession has ever gone to caravans was, I think, a booklet by Jane Drew producing a layout for trees that hid the cars that brought the caravans there. Um, now, 
what should what should clients look for? Well, as I said earlier, they should be in a jolly frame of mind when they feel that they have sufficient time to involve the architectural profession in the future well-being of their life. Um, the, there was one thing, I think again our, our president-elect said that it's all chaos and all disaster and we're all worried and nervous and things. What the hell was it like during the Napoleonic Wars in this country? And I don't think it was all that easy in this country during the 30s. We happen to be sailing through the longest period of peace this country has, has had for, for very many centuries. So that baffles me completely. But what does worry me is that whereas architects, I think, are all right. Good ones are always all right. Bad ones can always get better. What worries me is the profession doesn't like the idea of uncertainty. If something is uncertain, they call it a crisis or panic or a, or a, yes, a crisis. It keeps cropping up. Now, unless architecture realizes that calculated uncertainty is one of the great generators for what it should be doing in the future, then I think the profession has, has no future. I think architecture has. Thank you.